Kate, you're muted. I apologize. Let's take that from the top. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Kate Silverstein with NOAA's National Ocean Service Public Affairs team. I want to start by thanking you for joining us for this press conference today, where we'll discuss this year's annual high tide flooding outlook for the U.S. And we'll also introduce a new monthly high tide flooding outlook that predicts where high tide flooding might occur for each day of the year. To provide more details, I'm very excited to welcome Nicola Buss, the director of NOAA's National Ocean Service, who will provide an overview of today's news. We also have four NOAA experts who will join us for the Q&A portion of today's call. From NOAA's Center for Operational Oceanographic Products and Services, we have Gregory Dusick, Chief Scientist, Karen Cavanaugh, Coastal Host Hazards Oceanographer, Annalise Keeney, Coastal Hazards Oceanographer, and joining us from NOAA's National Ocean Service Headquarters, we have William Sweet, Oceanographer. I'll start with just a few housekeeping items. Uh, this press conference is being recorded if you do not wish to be recorded, please disconnect at this time. We'll begin with remarks from Nicola Buff, and then we'll take questions from reporters. If you're a reporter and you would like to ask a question, you can hit, click the hand icon in the GoToWebinar window next to your name. NOAA staff will then call on each reporter who has virtually raised their hand, and your line will be unmuted. You can also use the questions tool in your GoToWebinar window to type a question for our speakers. We'll then read that question out loud for one of our speakers to answer. Please be sure to state or type your full name and media affiliation when asking your question. And with that, I have the honor of welcoming the director of NOAA's National Ocean Service, Nicole LaBeouf, to open our call. Thank you, Kate. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Nicole LaBeouf, and I'm the director of NOAA's National Ocean Service. Today, NOAA is releasing an enhanced suite of high tide flooding products to help communities across the country better prepare for and mitigate high tide flooding impacts. Let's start by defining high tide flooding, also sometimes called nuisance or sunny day flooding. This flooding happens when tides reach anywhere from one to two feet above the daily average high tide, covering what is typically dry land along the coasts and leading to inundated roadways and other infrastructure. As relative sea levels continue to rise, high tide flooding is occurring more frequently. It no longer takes severe weather to cause disruptive flooding along the coast. Over time, recurring high tide flooding can have major impacts on coastal communities like degrading infrastructure, property, and coastal ecosystems. NOAA maintains a network of coastal tide gauges known as the National Water Level Observation Network. These gauges collect continuous water level, oceanographic, and meteorological data for the nation. Some of these gauges have been recording data for more than 100 years, providing critical long-term data sets to support coastal decision making. Through this network, NOAA monitors the rapid increase of high tide flooding and the steady creep of sea level rise. Released today, our 2023 annual high tide flooding outlook brings together data about high tide flooding events recorded at 98 NOAA tide gauge stations between May 2022 and April 2023. This annual span of time as known, is known of as the meteorological year. NOAA's 2023 flooding outlook also provides predictions of high tide flooding through April 2024 this outlook shows that on average, U.S. coastal communities experienced four high tide flood days in 2022, falling squarely within our prediction from last year of three to seven days. That said, some communities saw more flooding than others. The Pacific Northwest and the Mid-Atlantic coasts observed the highest numbers of high tide flooding days, each with an average of eight days over that 12-month period of time. Excessive high tide flooding was not limited to the Northwest and Mid-Atlantic coasts, in the Southeast Atlantic, for example, Trident Pier at Port Canaveral in Cape Canaveral, Florida, recorded 16 high tide flood days since in 2022. For comparison, this particular station did not receive any high tide flood days in the year 2000. So how much high tide flooding can we expect this year? NOAA's 2023 annual high tide flooding outlook projects U.S. coastal communities will see four to nine high tide flood days on average, 
between May 2023 and next April. That's up from last year's prediction of three to seven days. NOAA's 2022 data also indicate that increased high tide flooding is not isolated to a few regions, but is accelerating in many locations across the country due to sea level rise. In addition, a new factor in the mix this year is the strengthening of El Nino conditions that are predicted to further amplify high tide flooding frequencies at more than a third of NOAA's tide gauge locations in the east and west coasts. Communities in the Mid-Atlantic and Gulf are predicted to experience the most high tide flood days as El Nino conditions will compound the effects of sea level rise in some locations. For the Mid-Atlantic, nine to 14 high tide flooding days are predicted, representing a 300% increase since the year 2000. On the West Coast, high tide flooding is largely driven by El Nino conditions rather than sea level rise, so there too, more flood days are expected this year. For the Pacific Northwest, four to 11 flood days are predicted, representing 150% increase since the year 2000. For the Pacific Southwest, one to five flooding days are predicted, an almost 100% increase over the year 2000. Clearly, high tide flooding is not just a regional, but a national issue and is expected to accelerate well into the future. In fact, by 2050, NOAA predicts that coastal communities across the nation will experience an average of 45 to 85 high tide flood days per year. The good news is that the data NOAA delivers directly helps coastal communities make informed decisions about flooding over the next year and into the future. And in addition to NOAA's annual high tide flooding outlook, which I've been describing so far, we are excited to release NOAA's new monthly high tide flooding outlook. Replacing the seasonal high tide flooding bulletin, our new monthly outlook provides the likelihood of high tide flooding each day in the calendar year up to a year in advance at NOAA tide gauges across the nation. While the monthly outlook does not account for real-time weather conditions, it can be paired with weather forecasts to understand if an approaching storm might coincide with already elevated water levels. Coastal communities can use this authoritative information to make informed decisions about flooding risks, like whether to close roads, perform maintenance on storm drainage systems, or prepare for emergency protections for other vulnerable infrastructure. Together, NOAA's monthly and annual high tide flooding outlooks provide coastal communities with the information needed to protect lives, properties, and ecosystems and economies. As towns, states, tribes, and businesses such as ports and related maritime commerce industries and the federal government increasingly consider the impacts of coastal flooding and related hazards, NOAA's National Ocean Service is the authoritative source of data and information on a wide range of risks. And thanks to funding from the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, NOAA is making even more critical enhancements to our products so communities and industry have the coastal, coastal risk information they need when they need it. One last note, NOAA is not just our nation's sea level rise data provider. Across the United States, many of NOAA's people and facilities, forecast offices, marine science labs, visitor centers, and much else are located in the coastal zone. That makes NOAA, including the National Ocean Service, a truly vested stakeholder at the center of the national conversation on sea level rise. With that, thank you again for joining us today. I will now turn the call back over to Kate Silverstein, who will facilitate questions and answers. Thank you, Nicole. Um, we will now move to the Q&A portion of today's press conference. Uh, just to remind folks, if you would like to ask a question, you can use the hand icon in the GoToWebinar window next to your name in the attendee list that appears on the right-hand side of your screen. NOAA Communications will call on each reporter who has a virtually raised hand. Once you're called on, your line will be unmuted, and you may also need to unmute yourself by selecting the microphone icon next to your name. You can then ask your question to our experts. You may also use the questions tool in the GoToWebinar window to type a question for our speakers about today's outlook. We'll then read that question out loud for a response from our experts. 
be sure to state or type your full name and media affiliation when asking your question. Please note this time is specifically reserved for questions from the media. And with that, we look forward to your questions. Just a moment while we queue up our first question. Okay, I am calling on Mark Shuffelstein first. Uh, Mark, it looks like you are muted. You might want to take try to take yourself off mute and let's see if we can hear you. Hey, Mark, can you try speaking? It does look like you're unmuted, but we're having trouble hearing you. Uh, Mark, if you want to go ahead and type your question into the questions box, we can also address your question that way. For the time being, we're going to move on to our next question from Sophia Smith from WHYY. Sophia, your line Thank is open. You. Thanks. Um, in the Mid-Atlantic region specifically, um, with the increases we've been seeing in recent years and then the projection for this year, can you speak to the role of anthropogenic climate change um, versus land subsidence versus El Nino um, in causing those increases? Sure. Um, this is William Sweet. I'll address that question. Um, you know, the Mid-Atlantic is definitely an area with high rates of land subsidence for some natural and unnatural reasons, natural being compaction of sediments, uh, sort of an impact crater that had formed uh, millions of years ago. There's also still settling from the last glacial maximum, as well as uh, some unnatural reasons, uh, pumping of groundwater for drinking. Uh, so that is really currently causing about half the overall uh, rate that we're witnessing. Um, it's hard to really break it down in terms of the floods that are caused by uh, land subsidence versus sea level rise, but there's a very strong signal in the ocean rise component itself, upwards of 70% or so of the rise that we've been experiencing in the last several decades has been attributed to anthropogenic warming. Uh, so it's definitely, you know, many reasons causing sea level rise, which is driving this rapid increase in high tide flooding, which is for the most part, accelerating on an annual basis in this part of the country, meaning impacts are growing in leaps and bounds. Uh, so by the time you recognize water coming out of stormwater systems, uh, flooding, water on the streets when it's sunny outside, those impacts are going to become chronic rather quickly. Thank you. Um, thanks, Dr. Sweet. We will take our next question from Zach Coleman from Politico. Zach, I've unmuted you. You might need to unmute yourself. Great, thank you for doing this. Um, kind of building off that last question, I mean, I maybe this is neither here nor there, but in terms of um, land development, uh, what kind of impact does the the movement over wetlands with you know development uh, influence any of these these flooding events uh, relative to some of the climate signals that you're seeing? Uh, this is William Sweet again with the National Ocean Service. Um, you know, impervious surface, uh, it doesn't help. Uh, the, the real issue with high tide flooding, let's say, when it comes to development is, you know, a flood is only a flood if it floods. So really from, you know, a human humanistic standpoint, you know, we've got a lot of stuff in the way and the tide is is sort of, you know, reaching the brim in many of these communities. When it rains, uh, oftentimes the drainage systems, the stormwater systems that we have in place that might have been laid in the ground you know, upwards of a century ago in, in many areas. Uh, with high tide flooding, water is starting to backfill within these systems, spill out onto the roads. So when you does rain uh, you know, through an urbanized environment, there's just really no place for that water to clear. The downhill gradient is really diminished in many of these stormwater systems. So you know, in short, we're building more at the coast. 
Uh, we're getting heavier rains is another signal with, with the warming of the atmosphere, it can hold more moisture. And with sea level rise and high tide flooding really causing, you know, a jam, if you will, in the drainage capacity within these communities. Uh, we're really starting to see the impacts of both high tide flooding and intense rain and where they meet at the coast. Uh, it's a very fragile area and our infrastructure is struggling to keep up with the, uh, the demand and the, the forcing coming from both the ocean and the, uh, and the air. Thank you. Um, we are now going to take our written question from Mark Shuff, I'm sorry, Shuffin at the Times Picayune. Uh, Mark writes, are there any plans to add gauges in Louisiana, add additional gauges in Louisiana? The new dashboard seems to only include Grand Isle, which is surrounded by a levee. So I can I can add uh, answer that one. This is Greg Dusek. Um, so uh, the reason with so with the dashboard with the monthly predictions, um, our limiting factor there in terms of being able to accurately predict uh, likely flooding months in advance is really. Uh, you know, tide, how, how your tidal signal is compared to other factors. And so the places where our model does not work quite as well are some of the locations in the Gulf in particular. Um, and so, you know, what we're going to be doing in the coming months to year, uh, year, next few years, is trying to improve our model by accounting for, you know, the, the more non-tidal forcing uh, over the, you know, the future next few months or so. Uh, and then we hope to be able to add additional golf stations to the outlook, uh, to the monthly outlook um, here, uh, hopefully in, in the near future. Great, thank you, Gregory. Our next question comes from Craig Miller with PBS Next Avenue. Uh, Craig writes, Florida real estate is booming even along the coast, despite these predictions and the current vulnerabilities. What would you say to prospective residents? Uh, this is William Sweep, the Ocean Service. Um, I'd say pay attention to the maps, the data, the models, the output that NOAA is providing in our federal partners to uh, give folks an idea of what's coming. You know, we're making not only next year predictions, but we're also giving guidance as to what to expect over the next 20 or 30 years if we don't take action. You know, these numbers are not to scare there to help prepare. You know, flood is only a flood if it floods. So uh, do due diligence, you know, look out for your, uh, your property, obviously, but the communities that hold their systems of systems at risk. Uh, and if we start now by identifying, you know, what potentially is going to be exposed and vulnerable, we can take action to remediate against the, the, the impacts that are likely to come such that we can continue to have sort of a viable and in lively coast where folks live and, and support this economy and the country that we live. Thank you, Dr. Sweet. Um, it looks like we have one more question at this time. So I wanna make sure that folks are um, able to ask all the questions of their experts. Um, there's two ways to ask a question. I'll remind folks again, uh, you can use the raise hand icon next to your name, or you can type your question in the questions box um, in your control panel. So with that, I will um, read a written question from David Borak, WFAE in Charlotte. Um, David writes, in the Carolinas, can you provide a couple of examples of areas affected by high tide flooding and speak to whether communities are adapting or talking about adapting? Sure, uh, this is uh, William Sweet again. Um, Having grown up in North Carolina and, and firsthand seen the, the beautiful beaches that they have that string the coastline, uh, there are problems. In the Pamlico Sound areas were uh, very flat, very low lying along uh, Highway 12 on the Outer Banks, uh, you name it. There's a lot of land subsidence going on in the, the uh, upper parts of North Carolina. Uh, this area is exposed to tropical storms, is exposed to extratropical storms or nor'easters and high rates of sea level rise. Areas like Beaufort and North Carolina, uh, uh, Wilmington, North Carolina, Manio, uh, water is creeping up into stormwater drains and backflowing into the streets. Um, so communities are, are recognizing the issues uh, and they're taking um, action to uh, combat the issue. You know, the first part in any 
problem is figure out, you know, where you're vulnerable so you can take action. And with the maps and the data that we're providing, they're doing just that. They're planning and looking ahead uh, again so that they're prepared for what's coming. Uh, so that again, the flood is only a flood if it floods. If you take action now, you can uh, help uh, mitigate against any potential impacts that are that are planned to to come. Thank you. And um, maybe this is a question for Gregory. Um, this is from so so Sophia Schmidt from WHYY, and she writes: Do the plans to improve the model and add more stations in Louisiana? also apply to more inland stations in bays and rivers she's saying for example philadelphia along the delaware river yeah yes um, we'll be evaluating all of our more you know more inland stations i mean chesapeake bay is another region where our monthly uh, outlook is is not quite as skillful and really it's those locations again where where the tide is not quite as significant and so, you know, to, to improve that, it means being able to model those non-tidal factors more accurately looking forward in time. And so, so yes, that is part of the plan. That's what we're gonna, gonna be working on over the next uh, few years. And, and hopefully we'll be able to add some of those uh, more riverine stations in the near future. Thank you. And other experts on the line, if you have things to add, just please jump in. Um, I'm gonna go to our next question um, from Dina Pulver with USA Today. Um, Dina asks, could you please talk about the impact of marine heat waves on high tide flooding? Sure, this is William Sweet with the Ocean Service. You know, marine heat waves are just that. It's, it's warm ocean blobs of water uh, that are heating down in the southeast and the Gulf right now. The same phenomena that's causing these Oceans to warm are also causing these oceans to rise. Uh, so it's that component with seas that have been accelerating over the last decade or two in the southeast and the Gulf. Uh, we're having heavier rains, potentially more uh, damaging hurricanes. It's really a, a double or triple whammy in lots of ways. It's putting stress on the ecosystems. It's putting stress on the public systems. So the heating that's occurring as we warm our atmosphere, it's warming our oceans, it's causing the seas to rise, it's causing more intense rains, fueling stronger hurricanes, and it's you know, causing damage to the ecosystems, the bleaching of corals. It's indicative of a warming climate, a warming ocean, uh, and it's something that really should be uh, grabbing our attention and a telltale of what's to come if we don't get ahead of the curve in terms of this climate situation. Kate, can I jump in and, and just add a couple things? Absolutely. Yeah, so I want to amplify something um, that Billy just said uh, about how this data is used not to scare, but to prepare. Uh, NOAA is creating uh, partnerships uh, across key professional societies like the American Society for Civil Engineering, the real estate industry, the insurance and reinsurance industries. Um, as well as other federal agencies um, within the Department of Defense and others who really, really care about coastal hazards because they know it can affect not just um, uh, national security, but also critical parts of our supply chain. I can tell you that key ports around our country, um, one of the things that is first and foremost on their minds are, is coastal change, including sea level rise and some of the, the hazards that um, we've been talking about today. And so, uh, really trying to get the word out about how these data can be used to inform our planning. It's not just science for science sake, right? It's science for decision making and for real solid planning. And we have more and more at our fingertips the ability to make good plans. Um, and, you know, I would encourage folks not only to uh, look closely at these products, but also at some of the work that we'll be doing over the next couple of years to further bring the science um, from, from, from water models of one type to water models of another type together so we can better understand the converging conditions along the coast and help plan for the future. Thanks so much, Nicole. Um, I am not seeing any more questions, so I'll do a final reminder um, in, in case folks have anything left they'd like to ask our experts. Uh, media, to ask a question, you can use the raise hand icon um, which should be to the left of your name in the attendee list. You can also type out a question in the question section of the control panel. So I'll give it just one more minute. 
while we wait to see if there are any additional incoming questions. Okay, sure. Here is uh, one additional question from Dina Pulver with USA Today. Uh, she asks, what can the average person do in response to high tide flooding? I'll take a stab at that. Oh, sorry, Karen, did you want to try? I can, I can try. So go one for thing it. That we've been working with is reaching out to stakeholders about the monthly outlook and the annual outlook as well and, and seeing how people can use it. I think that this is something that kind of gets wrapped up. Um, we're going to be training our meteorologists at National Weather Service to look at the monthly outlook um, when they're making weather forecasts. So they can see where there's high risk days that we're highlighting. But also when you have a storm event that comes in, um, it can make things that much worse. Um, and also um, floodplain managers and local communities are looking at this at, and very excited about this because this will help them prepare about staffing, if they need to close roads. Um, even after an event, like I go vacation in the Outer Banks um, and after a high tide flood event, there's sand covering the roads. So this will help people plan for um, removing sand um, from the roads and opening up that much sooner. Um, civil engineers planning construction, um, because when you're um, digging an underground garage or something like that and excavating, we heard sometimes you have saltwater intrusion because of a high tide flood event. So it's, they're going to be looking at this now as they're planning out those um, construction projects to look at when it's a good time to be doing that excavation and when it's a good time to maybe not. Um, so I think eventually as this gets wrapped up into weather forecasts and stuff, this will be that much more useful for a daily like use, planning your commute even. I think getting your kids to school and, and stuff like that. Um, but we have, we're working up to that. Go ahead, Nicole, with what you were going to add. Well, I was just going to sort of respond that um, there's really no average person because each of our decision making processes is going to vary based on where we are and um, how far into the future we're looking, right? So um, some of the examples that Karen just gave are fantastic. Um, just, just like when we're planning anything in our lives, like say, even planning out for retirement, we try and think about all the things that are going to come our way. Um, we can't know everything that our lives will experience between now and then, but we can take some educated guesses and we know there are some things that we can predict. Um, and so we plan around those. In this case, um, high tide flooding on an annual and now monthly basis um, is something that we can predict in these locations. And so whatever your plans may be, um, uh, your daily life or your long-term life or your business decisions, um, you have information that can be made, that is available to you um, uh, for your decision support. And so we'd really just encourage you to take a look at it um, and uh, work it into your uh, short-term and long-term plans if you're going to be around the coast for any period of time. Thank you. If I may, this is Annalise yeah, Janine. I was just wondering if I could follow up on that. I wanted to... Um, uh, to, to mention the fact that all each of these products you've seen today that we've demonstrated, the enhancements are, are based on community feedback, user and stakeholder feedback. It's so important that we go out to these communities and understand what's actually happening on the ground and what their needs are so that we can combine effectively of the variety of different products that we have. Um, we've talked about the monthly outlook and then also the annual outlook combines decadal projections and sea level rise scenarios, some that are actually, and, and the sea level rise scenario that's most specifically in tune with that region. So we've taken leaps and bounds to try to give people context to the information that we're supplying. In addition to accessible data, um, uh, Co-ops, the Center of Operational Oceanographic Products and Services, has an API that hosts this information, and it'll soon to be on data.gov in, included in that. So um, all of the information that we're providing to you is based on what we're hearing from our communities, um, and we're listening still. So we want to hear what's necessary for the next generation of this product or these products as well. Thanks, Annalise. That's really helpful. 
Um, we do have a few more questions that have come in in just the last few minutes. Um, so I'm going to read another one out loud from Craig Miller at PBS. Craig asked, um, do you favor managed retreat in some areas or will hard or soft coastal defenses hold the line long term given the conditions that we're projecting? That's a really tough one. So I'm going to jump in uh, for my team. Um, uh, probably the word favor is not the one I would use um, to describe a, a response to that. It's going to vary um, what the best solution is, a location by location. One of the things that we are um, certainly very much aware of is that changes along the coast are highly localized. Um, and so we can provide um, projections for uh, communities and for regions, but when it comes to individual homes and neighborhoods and towns, uh, those folks will need to make those decisions for themselves. We are working uh, very much with local communities and local um, uh, industries and uh, county and state officials to help them engage uh, more fully and to be fully aware of the information that's available and to help them digest it so that they can make their own decisions that's right for them. I have been in communities in southern Mississippi where the right decision is to overhaul their stormwater drainage. Um, I have been in towns across um, other places in the Gulf Coast um, where they're looking at um, uh, making investments in other places, you know, in a neighborhood so that the homes that are in harm's way most often might be relocated. But those conversations are hard. They're very difficult to have. And so our role um, at the National Ocean Service is to provide communities with as much capacity and capability to have those conversations themselves. We help convene. We provide technical assistance to help them understand the data. Um, and then they really need to make the decisions for themselves in those, ca in, in those cases. Um, and we're very, very, um, I'll say very uh, honored and humbled to be a part of those conversations because that is, um, it's really the future of neighborhoods and communities. And um, anyway, I can't, I can't say enough about how we try and be as, as on the ground with those communities as possible to give them as many possible outcomes um, so that they can make those choices. Thanks, Nicole. Anything else from our other experts to add on that question? No? Okay, great. I think Nicole covered it really well. And we're going to go to a question, um, an audio question from Mark Schlefstein. Mark, your line is open. Okay. Uh, I think I got it working this time. You can hear me now? Yes, you great. sure did. Okay. okay. So um, uh, this is sort of a drill down question um, uh, following up to what you guys were just talking about. In Louisiana, there are a number of projects underway by the Army Corps of Engineers for um, building levees, uh, elevating homes, and by the state for a diversion of uh, water and sediment from the Mississippi River that's going to cause some water elevation uh, on its own. Um, how are you making sure that this most recent information that you have on estimates of what uh, sea rise will do to to normal tides is um, is in uh, taken up by the state and the Corps of Engineers and used in those projects. Okay. This is William Sweet with the National Ocean Service. Uh, you can take a first go at that. Uh, we definitely work in very close collaboration with our federal partners, including the Army of Army Corps of Engineers and the Department of Defense. Uh, the Corps of Engineers in particular have been you know, incorporating sea level rise into their project planning now for, for decades. So uh, as part of the U.S. Federal Sea Level Rise Task Force, one of our goals is to ensure that the latest science, uh, the best models, the most recent observations are synthesized and uh, bundled up into data and products and services, not only for NOAA, but for other partners like the Corps of Engineers, so that when they are building projects, uh, they have the very best information that uh, NOAA and NASA and our, uh, our, let's say the USGS, our federal partners uh, produce, because they're consumers of this science as well. And so just like our local uh, stakeholders, our local communities, 
at the federal level, it's, we really want to make sure, and we really strive hard to make sure that from the local to the federal, that this information is freely provided, uh, timely manner, and, and ways and means that folks can use it in uh, decision support for the project. So uh, we work closely with the Corps of Engineers, and they and we're all working off the same playbook. Thanks, Dr. Sweet. Um, anyone else want to uh, respond to that final question? Okay. Well, that looks like it was our last question. Um, so with that, I do want to again thank today's speaker, uh, NOAA's National Ocean Service Director, Nicole LaBeouf, as well as our experts who joined for Q&A, uh, Gregory, Karen, Annalise, and William. Uh, for the media, we'll have a recording of today's briefing uh, posted online shortly, and that'll be linked from both the NOAA press release and NOAA media advisory, which you can find on NOAA.gov in the news section. And finally, uh, if you have any follow-up questions, please don't hesitate to contact me, Kate Silverstein, at our National Ocean Service media inbox. The address for that is Ocean Service Press, no periods or spaces, at NOAA.gov. Again, that's Ocean Service Press at NOAA.gov. That concludes today's video conference. Thank you so much for joining us.